Ja, ähm, <laughs> somehow or other, I had made it to India, partially uh, by hitchhiking, by, partially by bus. One of those buses was called the Magic Bus, and the magic was that it made it all the way to India. <laughs> um, a trail of screws and like, you know, coughing smoke from the back, somehow or other, <coughs> it made it. We all felt that the journey was not ordinary. We all felt that there was some higher power that was with us. Because we knew we're not on an ordinary journey. We're on a pilgrimage. That we knew. Exactly where the pilgrimage was leading, we had no idea. But India it was. Um, I roamed around in my time in India, in different places, um, until somehow or other I came to Vrindavan um, after a long journey. I could have written my book, but I guess Ron Lambert beat me to it. <laughs> because he stopped in Istanbul. And so did I. He had no money in Istanbul. I had some left, so I stayed in a better part of town. Um, but in Tehran, it was, my money was also running out, and I stayed in the same horrible, hippie place that Maharaj describes in his book. And the smoke was billowing out of every window, and the beds were filled with bed bugs. Afghanistan was hippie's paradise, but I didn't come for that. Um, Radha describes how in he describes how in Kandahar there was this opium din. I missed that in Kandahar because there was a dust storm, so I never found the opium din. <laughs> but I did come to Kabul where there was a beautiful girl who invited us to play in one one club in the evening, since you heard our music, and we'll put something in the tea. Oh, that was intense. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Intense cup of tea, I can tell you. I don't like cup of tea, actually. <laughs> Not for that, you know. Oh, gosh. For one week, the front door was open and the back door was closed, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> intense, intense cup of tea. Came to India with a solemn vow, you know. <laughs> I will be definitely not telling any of those things. That was a blessing, actually, um, because I came for other purposes. When the government officer, uh, a Sikh with a turban, who was dressed in a uniform, sitting behind a desk under a tree, asked me, not in an office, but under a tree, which I thought was far out, <laughs> and would have asked me why I had come to India while he was polishing his big curly mustache. Um, I said, because I think I heard that India is a very spiritual place. Ta-da! Ta-da! <laughs> then you will go to Benares. <laughs> You never argue with the men in uniforms, so I said, yes, yes, I will go. He said, yes, you will go. He said, because I will buy you the ticket. So what a welcome, right? And he came that evening at the station to buy me the ticket to go to Benares. Well, there I became familiarized with Indian, uh, yeah, with people worshipping in temples and, uh, and mantras and, and uh, people coming at night and putting little boats made of leaves and filled with flowers and leaves in the Ganga, people singing various mantras and songs and the local top hit that was playing all the time was I like the city. But I see. And my musical ears sort of became attracted to that. So, so after a while, 
and that mantra entered into my consciousness and stayed there. And it is certainly by the mercy of that mantra and that uh, I came on the spiritual path because that was the gift I brought back from uh, from the nurse. Uh, Mayavat, it didn't touch me. Mayavat, although it was there, it didn't impress me. Karma Kanta, I saw it everywhere on the banks, right? Brahmana priests, you know, doing little rituals for people, but it passed me by. Yogis with beards who invited me to come to the back and smoke a chill with them, they passed me by because I was from Amsterdam. So, <laughs> I had no more need for all those things. Uh, that, was, that was behind me. Uh, and I came to, to that land of Vrindavan, but not in of India, and I, in the course of time, well, money ran out and visa ran out, and I made it back home. But the mantra stayed with me. Uh, and for years, I chanted that mantra. Even, you know, like when my mother was somehow or other on her deathbed, I thought, what do I do now? What do you do? You want to do something. And I thought, let me sing that holy temple song, as I would sort of in my mind call it at the time. Let me sing that. So somehow or other, in the last moments, I was able to chant that see young day, young day, day which later on I found out was just the right thing to do. So it was my good fortune that I was able to do this service at that time. Um, yeah, so then someone, one friend of mine, who, we lived in a house, all vegetarians, eating brown rice with chopsticks, and, the, and, and herbs from the forest. Right? My friend was working in the, in the forest department and cleaning the forest, and he would bring all these herbs, and we would eat all these wild things. Mm -hmm. um, it was very healthy, I guess. <laughs> um, and I smuggled some cheese in my room sometimes, and no one watched. But anyway, um, somehow or other, my friend, one day, disappeared, and the next day I heard he had moved into the Hare Krishna temple. I went there to save him, but <laughs> somehow or other, um, he saved me, because he told, I had already a ticket to India in my pocket, and he said, when you go to India, you must go to Vrindavan. Now, I had decided that I would go to the Tibetans, right? this time, and that I would spend some time there. So I said, yes, yes, I will go to Vrindavan. And I went to the Tibetans, up in Maglav Ganj, you know, you go to Punjab, Patankot, and then you go up into the Himalayas, and you go to Dharamsala, and above there is Maglav Ganj, you know. And that is the village where the Dalai Lama lives, and that is where, uh, all day long you hear these Tibetan prayers and rituals. Oh, you, 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 you. It sounds like this. <laughs> and uh, I was there. In the center of town, they had these prayer mills. Uh, vertical cylinders sitting on an axis that spin around. And one spin is a prayer. And they had a whole battery of them, 10 on one side and 10 on the other side, sort of next to each other. And people were walking around in circles, pushing these prayer bells. There were benches on the side, so I thought, you know, this is an interesting place to sit and watch the people that are pushing these bells. Um, so there might be some interesting people here. And I was sitting there, and then at one point, there was an original llama, a, a real one, you know, like the old and wrinkled and like in robes and the whole thing. The kind of person I really wanted to meet. And uh, so he came around, swung the prayer mills and I greeted him and no reaction. So 
Anyway, he was going in circles, so I thought the second time that I would catch him. <laughs> and, you know, I'm an energetic person, so in, in those days, even more than now. <laughs> so I would sort of, I went like, uh, I waved at him in a way that you have to be blind for not seeing. <laughs> and he didn't see me. He just looked right to me. I mean, it was sort of clear he was ignoring me. And it was getting a little awkward, you know. And, uh, yeah, and then he left. No, not a, nothing, no acknowledgement of my existence at all. Um, now, I had read something about Buddhism, and I was thinking, you know, what does he think? Does he think that I'm a projection of his mind? Well, I don't like to be a projection of his mind, I was thinking to myself, right? So right there and then, I lost interest in Buddhism. And I just thought, like, you know, what kind of philosophy is this where they think that I'm a projection of his mind? And where the man just basically has zero interest in anyone, because they're anyway illusion. So somehow or other, someone inadvertently had given me a Bhagavad Gita as a gift as it is. Anyway, so I opened it up and it just fell open at the page about impersonalists. So, okay, I read about this impersonalist and I read about the happiness that the person, impersonalist is experiencing, which is limited. Uh, he reaches his stage of liberation and that is it. Whereas the happiness of the devotee is eternally increasing. And I just saw the two concepts, and I saw that the concept of bhakti, of an ever-increasing love, was an ecstatic concept, which was growing and growing, and that the concept of Brahman emerging was a stage where once you reached it, that was it. It was static. It wasn't moving. So I realized the bhakti concept is the bigger concept. And right there, I said, then that must be the truth. Then I decided, I knew that there was a Hindu temple some two kilometers down over a path. And uh, I thought, okay. And I knew there was a picture of Krishna. So I thought, let me go there and let me offer a flower to Krishna. As I was walking with my flower in the hand down the road, I thought, I might as well chant Hare Krishna. Uh, to make the offering more complete. And, well, that meant for me singing Hare Krishna. So I walked with the flower in the road, loudly chanting Hare Krishna. And there might have been people who thought that I was a lunatic or something, but I didn't really care because I was 10,000 kilometers away from home. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't care. And just then, one boy from my hometown comes around the corner. <laughs> Now everybody knows, you know. I mean, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you know, just carry on, you know, and act as if you do this every day, you know. <laughs> so I went down the road and I offered my flower to Krishna. And it was then that I decided to go to Vrindavan. So I went to Vrindavan and um, I came to Mathura by train, it was a long journey, and I asked local people, uh, can, I, uh, can I walk to Vrindavan? Is it, is it close? Can I walk? They said, oh yeah, it's very close, you can walk. Anyway, 20 kilometers, uh, maybe close for them, but for me it was a serious walk. Anyway, somehow or other, I came over the main road, the, the uh, Delhi Agra Highway by a Chattis car. And I walked all the way and I came to Vrindavan towards the evening. And I came, as I walked in those days, the road of, was very, was much smaller than now. And there were no cars, practically. I mean, you'd see in Vrindavan maybe one car per hour. That was about it. And so it was like, you know, no traffic. And 
That evening, I, I walked into the sun was setting. I walked towards Vrindavan, and there were many cows also going to Vrindavan. So I was accompanied by cows, okay, on my entrance into Vrindavan. So it seemed that the mood was set, and I entered into, through the gate, the Prabhupada gate in Vrindavan, like that, and, and walked a bit further, and came to the Krishna Bhagavan Mandir. It was just quarter to seven at night. And before the evening arti, they always had Tulsi arti. So the first thing I saw, that all these people suddenly bowed down to a plant. And I thought, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a bit much for my mind. And then when the doors, and finally the doors of the altar opened, a little albino devotee came out. And he blew the conch shell, and that blew my mind. <laughs> and then there were the deities, and they were so beautiful, so inconceivably stunning, that for a moment I felt the hairs on my body, stand on end. Just then, at that first action. And then, uh, that never happened again. <laughs> but uh, what to say? Um, sometimes Krishna gives us a little bit of chaya bhav, a little bit of shadow attachment, where we, even in a neophyte state, get a moment of <laughs> of higher inspiration, not on the level of liberated souls, but nonetheless something genuine and something of uh, a cause of inspiration. And I did get such, such a moment right there and then, and I so strongly felt that this was not an ordinary place. I knew, very, I knew instinctively that I had sort of come to uh, a place that was outside of this, this material universe and that I just stepped into another dimension. Well, I sensed it. Well, and yes, everywhere there in Vrindavan, um, Krishna was so present. Well, very close, in those days, very close to our temple. Our temple was quite isolated, the Krishna Bhagavan temple, there was nothing around it, and all open fields, basically. Uh, we had neighbors on either side, and then <coughs> and nothing, all the way to the Delhi Arbor Road, and in between, and then after us to was Fogla Ashram, nothing, just open. Uh, so, it was very different. Uh, there were two huts on the other side, a tea stall, and, a, and one with some rickshaw, and otherwise behind it, there was an open, open park, which had been part of Paul Maharaj's college and was now neglected and used to. And if you walked through the park, then on the other side, you would come to Dhamanala Kund, which was at that time full of water, the place where Krishna swallowed the forest fire. Uh, and after, of course, swallowing something very hot and spicy, you get thirsty and you want something, uh, some cooling water. So Krishna put his heel in the ground and some cool water appeared and that place is known as Davanala Kund. Davanala means forest fire. Okay. So, Davanala Kund. That was our playground. Um, there, was a, there was a desire tree on the bank of Davanala Kund and we would climb in there and we had only one desire, to jump off the tree and to plunge into the cool waters in the hot summer. And in that way, we were there. In Dhamma Kund, um, right behind us, behind the temple, was Raman Reti. The Krishna Bhavana tree was still there, um, a dark tree and a, with, a, with a white one on top. And so many peacocks were living on, the, on, the, on that Raman Reti. In the afternoon, the cows would rest there, and at 6 o'clock in the evening, you could see like some 60, 70 peacocks who were all resting in the trees at night, so they'd assemble there to go to the trees. So, 
This is what we saw. So, how easy it was to remember Krishna in that environment. So, so natural. Um, as we just saw uh, a play about a Mongolartic with a nasty Kali Yuga monster of an alarm clock, the type that you know, want to throw, want to destroy. Yeah. Um, how different was it to wake up in Vrindavan? Because in Vrindavan you'd wake up from a wave of peacocks. And what would happen is the peacocks would call out somewhere around 3 a.m. And then on the other side of Vrindavan, other peacocks would, would respond. And then on the other side, peacocks would respond. And a wave of peacock sounds would just go up and down. And that was our alarm clock. Uh, it was definitely so transparent, so easy uh, to remember Krishna. There were no modern things, no cars, no scooters. Uh, some tongas were there, cows everywhere walking around, uh, bicycles were there. Uh, no, only cycle riches, no water riches didn't exist. Uh, <laughs> Therefore, in Vrindavan, there were no bungalows, there were only ashrams. Uh, it was just, everywhere were ashrams, and in each ashram there was kirtan. There was no television, what to speak of computers, they hadn't, been, hadn't come on the market yet, you didn't even know what they were. Um, there was no internet, there was only Vrindavan. And in every house, you would hear kirtan. If you walked through Vrindavan, you would just hear kirtan everywhere. So how, how much was Krishna present? It was just overwhelming in, in that Vrindavan to feel the presence of Krishna. However, staying in the Krishna Bhavara Mandir, one thing struck me even more, that how much Srila Prabhupada was present he was most present. First of all, it said although Prabhupada traveled extensively around the world, Vrindavan was his home. And around the world, Prabhupada would, uh, would, would instruct his managers how to manage. But in Vrindavan, Prabhupada was on top of everything himself. Because he knew that his Western disciples, and that was all he had at the time, had no idea of how things worked and how to do it. So he was keeping a tap on everything himself. Oh. And of course, there was the bell. Oh. The bell at the entrance gate, which was very important because that bell had to ring on the second, in an exactly proper time, Every hour, ringing the number of uh, well, whatever number it was or the time, and every half hour, and it had to ring during arati, and that had to be done by the chokidars, the security guards. Now, chokidar, the word itself, chokidar, is already sort of explaining everything. It's someone who sits on a little stool all day, choki. He sits on his choki. And he sleeps, basically. <laughs> That's what they do. Right? Even in the day, what to speak at night, right? They always sleep. So, basically, by, and Prabhupada said, I will judge the performance of the management by the ringing of the bell. It was impossible. Uh, Hari Case explains that when he was Prabhupada's secretary, that Prabhupada rang his own bell, the servant bell. And Harikesh came in the night, and Prabhupada says, Listen, listen, you hear that? You hear that? And Harikesh said, I hear nothing. And Prabhupada said, That's right, they're not ringing the bell. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it, you know, and then Harikesh had to go and sort it out. So, in, in 1978, I inherited the bell. My God, that bell. I mean, it was something else, that bell, because it had to ring no matter what. And I tell you, we've had times that the rope would always break, right? just at the crucial moment. 
and we've been we climbed up and we've been hitting on the thing with a hammer, you know, just to keep the ringing going in time, somehow or another. We've had times that not only the rope came down, but that the whole bell came down. <laughs> it was something else, you know, to keep this bell ringing all the time. It was, it was tough. Um, but for so many years, um, it remained our duty um, to keep that bell ringing, even when I was, I mean, there was one sannyasi, Akshaya Handramaraj, who had been a had been temple president, and he bought a special clock, a satellite clock, super advanced for its time, right? So that on the second we could ring the bell, you know, everything was just the bell. <laughs> the bell had a very high voltage. Uh, I mean, it was super important. So many things were there. Uh, there were the preaching rooms in the back of the temple where Gopa Krishna Maharaj had let Prabhupada and sh proudly showed him around. And then Prabhupada pointed his cane up, pointed at the fan and said, I've had to travel 10,000 kilometers to tell you that there's a bird nest in the fan. <laughs> and no one had seen it, but it was, there it was, exposed in front of Prabhupada. And a fool in front of the spiritual master. Um, Sila Rupa Goswami, in his Upadesh Amrita, is writing about Vrindavan and he's writing about the sacredness and increasing sacredness of various places. From Govardhan and eventually we come to Radhakund as the most sacred place in the entire universe. Satsuruk Maharaj wrote a book which is called The Samadhi Diary. And in this book, The Samadhi Diary, he describes that there's still a place which is more sacred than Radhakund. At least to him, he wrote. He said, in fact, there are two places that he considered more sacred than any other sacred place. Uh, he said, that place that place, those two places. The first place is Sri Prabhupada's Samadhi. And the second place is Sri Prabhupada's quarters. Because those quarters, right? They're not just Prabhupada's quarters. They tell a story. Um, Prabhupada's house tells a story. Ah, uh, yes. It was interesting. Um, we spent so many hours, especially in the winter when it was cold, chanting japa inside Prabhupada's house. My favorite, I would walk a little bit up and down, and my favorite spot was in front of the painting where Krishna Balaram and the cows are returning home at night. And it shows, um, it shows peacocks in the tree, it shows a squirrel in the front who is watching Krishna. It shows how all the eyes of the cowherd boys are on Krishna. It shows how even the cows and calves are looking at Krishna. And then it shows how uh, the residents of Vrindavan are, are standing there on the side. They are now, they have waited the whole day for Krishna and Balaram to come back. And they are so happily greeting uh, their, their sons. And then there are the, in the back, behind the columns or on the roofs are the gopis. Uh, they're looking from a distance. Uh, and Krishna's eyes are slightly turned to the side. And all that is there in that painting. And I was just absorbing that and seeing all these relationships and seeing how everyone, um, everyone had his relationship with Krishna. And just that painting was explaining everything. Ah, uh, there were so many things in Prabhupada's house. His passport was there also. In a glass box, his Japa Mala was there, uh, on which he 
used to chant. Ah. At first there, were no, there was no Murti of Prabhupada. There was a bust, you know, a golden bust. It is now still there in Prabhupada's house, but that was all there was behind his desk. The Murtis came later. Oh. And, uh, and then uh, there were some pictures. He saw some pictures of the Sankirtan party in uh, in Laguna Beach, and they were on the and they were like <coughs> swinging their legs out you know, all together and their arms up, and they were almost falling over like the leading tower of Pisa. It was a miracle that they didn't fall, uh, and all synchronized. And that picture was there. And some people had given Prabhupada pictures of deities. <coughs> And you could understand that it was not just to give Prabhupada a picture, but you could understand what these devotees were doing. They were trying to attract Prabhupada. They were trying to attract Prabhupada to come and see their deities, to come to their temples. So and in this way one can see each picture tells a story of a relationship and a reciprocation and so on. In all of this gone, there were only two places where they had copies of all Prabhupada's letters, in Los Angeles and in Vrindavan, and nowhere else. You know, I mean, there was a different time. The, there was, we didn't have anything beyond what Prabhupada had translated of the Bhagavatam. Uh, the, the tenth canto had not yet been started. We didn't have the Prabhupada Vilam Rita. We didn't have any biography about Prabhupada. Nothing. Nothing was there. Uh, now so many books, you know, so many things have come, but all these things were not there. Uh, but we had uh, the Bhagavatam up to the 10th canto, up to the pastime of the Brahmavi Mohandila, where Lord Brahma stole the calves and cowherd boys, the last chapter that Prabhupada translated to Bhagavatam. That up to that point we had um, so so many things were there. Um, yes. So my topic is entrance into Vrindavan. Um, because um, there are so many the descriptions we have of Vrindavan, and now, ah, you know, everybody's got something on his phone, everyone's got uh, so many things on Facebook, you know, you can just, uh, anyone who wants to download the 25 qualities of Srimadhu Radharani can just like, you know, do it in a snap, right? You know, with your eyes closed, you can sort of download and, and, and read them. Um, all these things are now so easily available. So, at that time, the Dhamma was different. At that time, we did get so many guests, sometimes, but not crowds. Kartik, Kartik was our festival. We were there in front of the deities dancing and we were not pushed by crowds. They were not like Radha Maharaj didn't come with 5,000 devotees. <laughs> Gopal Krishna Maharaj didn't come with 3,500 devotees from Delhi. And, and, you know, and then the other Yatras and Yatris and so on. All that we wasn't there. And we actually would chant the Dhamma Rastika and dance for hours. And, we could actually stand in front of the deities and have darshan, you know, like you just stand there for a long time without being pushed, without, you know, being pickpocketed or without anything. It was just, uh, um, no one had a phone, so no one was taking pictures. It was just peaceful. It was nice. And I stood in front of Radha Shama Sundar. But I felt this, this, particular problem uh, that although I stood right in front they were still far away another one of my favorite spots was to stand in the back so that I could see two altars 
both Krishna Balaram and Radhishyamasu. But yes, with time, more and more devotees came. And with time, more and more, the mood came to try and enter into the pastimes, the deeper pastimes of Radha and Krishna. And devotees were hugging trees in Vrindavan and, and all these things. Well, and again, I felt, but I cannot enter. I realized that I cannot really enter. And why was it so that I could not enter? I could not enter because I did not have the love of the gopis. You can hear about the gopis. Now I can write you a book about the gopis. I could speak about the gopis. I can tell you the Astakani Alila, although I'm not sure if I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> but, but whatever I know, I may know, but I cannot enter because I don't have. How can I hear about love that I don't have? and understand it to its fullest extent. How can a child understand conjugal pastimes of adults? Right? You can tell a child about it, but it cannot understand it. <coughs> Even if you have you know, one child who never heard of such things, conjugal activities, and another one that has heard, and the one that has heard about the, the bees and the birds and all those things, you know, which parents sort of, um, well, um, you know, you like to talk about the bees and, and the flowers and all these things tonight. You know, yeah. like as mothers tell their daughters, fathers tell their sons. And say, a child has heard about sexual activity, but what does the child understand for real, even if he's heard it all? What do we understand about, about the love that, that exists between Radha and Krishna? Only Theoretical, but we cannot fully, we cannot understand. Um, it reminds me of um, Tamar Krishnavaraj. After Tamar Krishnavaraj disappeared, I, I once had a dream of Maharaj where he appeared to me and he was just, he came from the sky and fell on the ground. And in front of me, I fell also on the ground. Then he picked me up, he was up first, and embraced me. And so much love was emanating, uh, and I knew he's in the spiritual world. Then our Satchinandan Swami also had a dream. And Satchinandan Maharaj is by nature, if you don't know, I'll tell you, he's my, I know him well, he's by nature very curious. <laughs> <laughs> so when Tamar Krishnamarch came to him in his dream, he said, uh, Maharaj, yes, he said, what's it like? <laughs> and Tamar Krishnamarch said, it's different than you think, Sachinanda Swami. <laughs> and that was the dream, Sachinanda. So, what can I say? These things are... Once we are there in the spiritual world, in Vrindavan, then we will know. So I speak about entrance into Vrindavan. Um, that is my thought. Mm -hmm. We can speak about the spiritual world. But how can we enter into the spiritual world? How can we be so sure that we will enter into Golok Vrindavan at the end of this life? We can speak about Boma Vrindavan and go there, you know, after a long journey and check into the MVT and, you know, and have a pizza in the restaurant. But can we enter into Vrindavan? I have tried. I sat in the Amuna with the water up to my neck 
and my beads floating in the water, chanting. But was I entering into Vrindavan? Uh -huh. And to, to an extent, but to what extent? Uh, Lord Rama meditates for 60,000 years on the dust at the lotus feet of the, of the gopis. 60,000 years of his years. <laughs> <laughs> and still I could not understand the nature of that dust. So, but as I was in Vrindavan, I realized more and more, Krishna is so prominent here. But one is even more prominent than Krishna here, and that is Prabhupada. And he is my entrance. He is my entrance ticket. I came through the Prabhupada gate. It is, it is by service to him that I get my entrance, that I get my connection. It is by service to him that I really are part of this. So that became my meditation. Now, it's 8 o'clock, and of course I can say so much more, because 9 o'clock, so I'm, I'm still on English time. <laughs> um, it's 8 o'clock, you know? That's <laughs> not mine. <laughs> it's 8 right now. <laughs> but anyway, and London is the center of the universe. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Anyway. Um, so, uh, I cannot touch on so much more. Um, so all I do now is just close this and say, all right, this was the introduction yeah, of, of where we'll go. We'll carry on a bit following Srila Prabhupada in Vrindavan and a bit more understanding uh, Vrindavan through his eyes and where he takes us. And, and then, of course, we'll go further. We'll go through the Parampara, we'll go through the six Goswamis. We'll go, ultimately, to uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. <coughs> Don't forget why Srila Prabhupada installed Krishna and Balaram. In the purpose through the Chaitanya Charita Rita Prabhupada makes it very clear because they're more different from Gornita. We used to, we used to have these kirtans that we go like in front of Krishna Balaram, they would run up and down towards the deities and chanting, Jaya Gora Nita, Jaya Gora Nita. Then we go to Krishna Balaram, then we chant, run up and down, and, uh, go, go to Gornita and then run up and down from them and say, Jaya Krishna Balaram, <laughs> just to kind of uh, keep that meditation alive that we had read about. Uh, it was something everyone was very conscious of that Prabhupada had, had said, because they're all different from Gornitai. Therefore, uh, we appreciate that it is through mercy, it is through mercy, that we can enter. And even up to the day of today, uh, whenever I feel that I'm falling short into entering into that dimension of Vrindavan, uh, which exists both within us and without us, at that time uh, I turn to the Gorni time, I turn to Prabhupada, for, for mercy. And that's the, it's the only thing. When we fall short in love, all we can pray for is mercy. And, and only then you know, can we actually uh, you know, get breakthrough uh, to the other side of the taste barrier. Uh, we saw the play, you know, they got higher taste. But it, is, it is true. To get that higher taste is a uh, is a great uh, that is a great difference. Um, Ruchi comes after Nista. It comes after Nista. Nista is where we are ready. 
ready to put our faith in Krishna, then simply Krishna Bhakti Kaila Sarva Prama Kritahai, then by serving Krishna, all benefit will be obtained. And thus, at this time, this time, we are ready to leave behind material attachments. You know, at that stage, say, okay, I just give up all my old attachments. Before, oh, we're holding on. We're holding on. <coughs> anyway, we'll touch upon all these things uh, in the next, over the next few days. I'll do not my theme of entrance into Vrindavan along with you. I don't know exactly where it's going to go, but one thing, do what's Vrindavan. That's for sure. Exactly how, I don't know. <coughs>